Now, I want to get to probably the most important part of this talk, how to establish cause and effect. And I have three um, areas to talk about here. Going from least effective to most, okay? So including covariates. Let's talk about the palm size. You remember the uh, males and females, the different palm sizes and longevity. So I've got um, hand size on the X and longevity uh, age on the Y. Um, if I put in male, female as a covariate in the analysis, there's no relationship here. So when you account for other variables, you can um, control, a lot of people use the word control for other variables. Um, you can do a much better job of finding out what's a true relationship and what's not. And in this case, we just eliminated really hand size as an important variable because it was explained that trend we thought we saw on the previous page was just explained by including uh, male, female in the model. So um, covariates uh, do uh, a decent job of attempting to control for these lurking or hidden variables. You remember I talked about that at the beginning. Multiple regression is the tool you'll use to most of the time to control for those lurking variables. Prism 8 does have this multiple regression. And the challenge is um, we can't always identify all the, in fact, we very often can't identify all the variables that we need to include. And even if we could, we can't measure all of them. That's, it's very hard to account for everything and measure everything all in one analysis. So um, an observational data set that just has a bunch of decent covariates, it probably isn't good enough, but at least it is an approach and it attempts to help you know what's cause and effect. The second uh, area is pure science. So certain things that you can map out. Here we've got smoking causes D, uh, changes in the D, mutations in the DNA, which leads to or lung cancer. And so scientifically, you can show that it's likely or logical that smoking causes lung cancer. The challenge here is it's difficult on science alone to say, you know, this will cause cancer in actual people because we all have different DNA and our bodies are complicated. And you really need to collect some data to, to understand how strong that cause and effect relationship is, if it exists. So science is, is nice, but the gold standard is randomization. So I wanna talk about this. So clinical trials are all based on this concept of randomization. You have your patients and you randomly assign patients to treatment and control with the hopes that all these extraneous variables, these lurking or hidden variables, get equally balanced in the two groups. And, um, you know, so this is the gold standard if you can run this. The problem here, and I think a lot of you know, is you can't a lot of times ethically run these experiments. You can't tell people, smoke a pack of cigarettes for 10 years you're in, the tree, you're in that group, <laughs> you got assigned to that group. Um, we'll give you the cigarettes for free, but it's still not gonna work. So you're not gonna get um, people, you can't force people to participate in many experiments. So that's what the challenge is. But if you can run a, a randomized trial, um, that's ideal. Here, I'll go back to that um, estrogen and heart attacks. If you remember, um, there was initially thought that estrogen or hormone replacement ther therapy in women reduced the risk of heart attacks, but they found out after running some trials, randomized trials, that, that in fact the opposite was true. Yeah, that was the study I showed earlier. So the randomized trial really saved the day here and reversed the incorrect conclusion that people had based on just a correlation. One, one question people often asked ask about uh, randomization is what if it's unbalanced? What if I randomize, but I get more females than males in one group or more older people than younger people? Well, that is gonna happen. Um, there's, there's a guarantee that your randomization won't be perfectly balanced. It's impossible to balance everything perfectly, but you don't know what to worry about, so to speak, when you randomize. So you just trust the randomization and you set your level of significance. So um, when you do a test and you get a p-value, that p-value is accounting for the fact that when you randomize, 
sometimes things will be unbalanced. So when you get something significant, and here I've got a um, significance level of 1%, 0.5 in each tail. If, you, if you're really worried about the randomization and being unbalanced and hurting you, well, you can be a little bit more aggressive in setting your cutoff or your, your significance level. You could make it uh, 0.01 instead of 0.05 or something even lower than 0.01. And that way, um, you know, the, the risk that you'll have a really unbalanced randomization hurt you will be, will be less. You'll, you know, you'll only, only reject when it's highly significant. Uh, you, can, you can still add covariates when you randomize, although most people don't when they randomize. But, you know, if, if you, statistically speaking, I don't know if there's rules in the FDA, but statistically speaking, you can still add covariates if there's more, you can put age in or gender or something in the, in the model, even though it might be hopefully roughly balanced with the randomization. Also, set your inclusion and exclusion rules appropriately, and before you collect the data, not after. You don't want to afterwards say, hey, you know, we should have excluded 75 and over because there are a couple in the treatment group. I, I didn't do that well. Let's get those. No, so you know, probably know you can't do that already, but um, yeah, so set your exclusion rules so that you don't have really extreme patients in your study that might happen to fall in one group or the other and really skew that result. Mm -hmm.